This is the first resource I will be using today, Frontier Life. This one is based on the expansion of Europeans and their descendants around the world between 1650 and 1920. It contains documents from the Anglophone frontier during this period, and this includes material relating to North America, Southern and Western Africa, and Australasia. For those of you who haven't used an Adam Matthew resource before, the bar at the top of the page and its drop-down menus provides the main point of navigation. And at the heart of any of our collections are the documents themselves. So here is the document section for Frontier Life. You're invited to browse the documents by theme. That's the tiles here. And you can also filter this by region, library or archive, or document type. Alternatively, you can view a full list of the documents. And again, the filter options for this are on the left-hand side. So if we choose to filter by a region such as Australia, So here you can see that we get two pages of results for Australian material. And once we have our results from the filter, we can also choose how we order them using the titles of these columns. So if we click on this little arrow by date, it will reorder the list with the earliest document first, which is this one, Instructions to Arthur Philip. So this is from the National Archives of the UK, and it contains the original instructions and letters of Arthur Philip, who was the first governor of New South Wales. You can see the details of the document here in the metadata, or we can click on the thumbnail, and this takes us to the image here. This in turn can be toggled onto a full screen view. Or off again and you can browse through the images. Or alternatively, you can click on thumbnails to see the full selection of images from the document. And again, clicking on one will take you into it. So this is obviously one of the first documents that was produced in Australia after Europeans arrived. So it's quite interesting to click through and see the sorts of things that were being sent back by Governor Philip. This is a list of the supplies that were most in need in New South Wales at the time. So it's very practical stuff, saws. Got some rulers here, glue. I do like the fact that wine measures were also required. Now if we go back to the document details page, you'll see that the metadata we've collected contains information on the document and its contents. So as well as the title and the archival reference, you've got date information, document type, contents notes as well, but also this region, the subject keywords, places, people, themes. Now these ones that are underlined, we can click on one of these and it will take you to a list of documents that have been tagged with that person or place or keyword. So here we have 10 documents relating to Arthur Philip that we've accessed by clicking on the metadata there. So this means that every document has plenty of information to describe it, and all of this can be searched. So if we look at this list, there's obviously a lot of correspondence that Arthur Philip wrote to and from Port Jackson, which became Sydney, and New South Wales as a whole. We can go into one of these letter collections. And again, the same principle applies. We can click on a thumbnail in order to see better what the document actually contains. 
go into full screen mode and have a read of this letter. So this one is chiefly about setting up courts in New South Wales. And of particular concern was whether military officers should be forced to serve on criminal courts in the colony. So there's documents like this that really show the start of Australia, how it was governed, what rules were in place and what problems people came up against while they were there what had to be sorted out by Arthur Philip as governor. So these people, subjects, regions, they link all of the documents together and that's something that we aim to get our metadata to do. The other feature I want to highlight in this resource does the same. This is the map chronology. So again, I can use this main navigation bar to click on an additional feature. And when we get into the map chronology itself, there's an introduction for new users, and you can select one of three maps to work from. Make this full screen. So to interact with the map chronology, you can either scroll down through the timeline on the left of the screen, or you can go to the map and hover over one of these dots and clicking on it will take you to an entry. And the entry on the left hand side will give you some very basic information about that particular event. You'll notice that there are subject keywords for these as well, and they're highlighted. And just as with the documents, if you click on one of these, it will take you back into the resource filtered by that subject keyword. Now these are related to that keyword from across the entire resource. So again, we can use our filter options on the left hand side. So here are all the results for settlement relating to Australia. And if you're interested in a particular date range, we can input the date here, either as years or if you want to be more specific, months and days as well. And again, click apply. And this will further refine your results. So we now have 86 results. So these are documents that are related to New South Wales, Norfolk Island, Tasmania, South Australia, and Western Australia. So a real variety here. Covering quite a few different topics as well, whether it's the Bly Mutiny, settlers beginning in Norfolk Island, paintings as well as documents. So on the map, I was looking at the Swan River colony. And we can see here a document related to what later became Perth. So this is a report from Captain Sterling. This was at a time when the Dutch were still interested in Western Australia. And Captain Sterling was the person who came up with a plan to land at Swan River and later extend the colony. So seeing his reports on the operations 
It's always going to be interesting. So we can go back to the document list and it will still be filtered as we did it before. The search will still be in place. And we can still pick out documents that we're particularly interested in, for example, about the Swan River Colony. So again, this is still about the establishment of Swan River. And the advantage of some of these documents, you can see it's a real variety between printed material, uh, lists of material, letters that were written, reports that were written, and they've all been bound together and that's how they're stored at the National Archives. But the advantage that you have is that many of them do have summaries in the back. that will give a content list from what comes before. And it's these summaries that have formed the basis of our metadata collection. So it just helps you find the material that's mo of most use to you. OK, so hopefully you can see that Frontier Life contains some fascinating material essential to understanding the European settlement of Australia. I'm going to swap now to another resource migration to new worlds. This resource combines tales of personal experience with official government records to create a record of European and Asian migration to North America and Australasia. That's between 1800 and 1924. So this is the next stage in the story for the European settlement of Australia after the initial colonies, the mass movement of people to the continent. In order to find documents in this resource, I'm actually going to use the advanced search feature. And this can be found in any of our resources here in the top right corner. What you'll find here is that you can search by keywords anywhere. Now that will search all of our metadata and for any printed documents, it will search the text of those as well for whatever term you enter. But you can also limit your search to title, author, ships, port, country from, country to, or nationality. So you can be a bit more specific with your searching. There's also options to have a proximity value, so words within a certain number of words of each other. And the filters that you find on the document list can be applied here as well. So just as an example, we know we're interested in migration to Australia. And let's say, as an academic, I'm interested particularly in the period after the start of the gold rushes, but before the 1901 Immigration Restriction Act. I can enter my dates here to restrict my results. And there were lots of people taking voyages at the time and not all of them went particularly well. So in my keywords anywhere, I'm going to be interested in compensation for what happened on board voyages. By using the asterisk at the end, what I'm doing there is asking the computer to look for compensation, compensates, compensates, lots of different combinations of that word. So I click search and you'll see that there's 37 results for compensation or compensates in that date range for people traveling to Australia. Now, not all of these results will necessarily relate to the voyage over, but we can use the theme to filter our list. So journey conditions is one of the themes that we can apply here. This limits our results to 12. So if we click on the first one, 
the diary of M.P. O'Shea. So O'Shea migrated from Castle Coma in Ireland to Melbourne via Dublin and Liverpool. You can see our search terms here highlighted in the metadata. And the description says that the diary continues beyond the end of the voyage to give details of his life in Melbourne and the outcome of his compensation claim. So diaries like this one contain so much information on the migrant experience, and unfortunately it was rarely an easy one. If you move through the images of the diary here, you can see that condition on O'Shea's voyage were really poor. He describes illness, drunken passengers, a scarcity of provisions, as well as early struggles in the new colony. And it really does focus on shipboard conditions. So that includes poor, insufficient food, drunken assaults on female passengers, seasickness, summary justice. And he obviously fell out with the captain because it was the captain who he took to court afterwards in Melbourne in order to try and claim compensation. Now, there is a good selection of personal accounts like this, with letters and diaries recording migrant experiences on the journey to Australia and life there afterwards. And again, the best way to access them is through the advanced search. So if we make a note of our preferred destination. And in document type, so these are all the different types of document that have been digitized as part of migration to new worlds. And you can see that one of them is personal account. So if we refine our search by that, and here we have them. So these really do give the story of migrants, temporary travelers, people working on ships, their letters, their diaries, their photographs. It's a really good range of material. Just going to click on this one, Surgeon's Diary. So as we go into this, you'll notice this bar on the right hand side of the image. Now, where a document has chapters or sections in it, they'll be displayed here so that you can easily jump to the first page in that section or chapter. What's particularly useful about this journal is that it has a transcript attached at the back. So not only does this make it easier to read what comes before, but you can also go into this bar up here choose a particular keyword that you're interested in, search for it, and it will return results in the document itself. So if you're interested in how passengers took their grog, you can have a look and find out that Miss McBain was sitting at the table taking hers when a lamp fell on her head and she got badly bruised, but fortunately nothing seriously wrong. And we can see from the next entry that she's better. So that's the sort of thing that the surgeon had to deal with on the ship as he was traveling over. So any document in the collection that is printed can be searched in this way. And a basic keyword search, um, either from the advanced search or from the search bar up here in the top right corner, will return results from the full text search as well. OK, so now moving on to our First World War collection. This is made up of three modules, personal experiences, propaganda and recruitment, and visual perspectives and narratives. You do get to access all three of them if you have access via this one portal. So you can search all three modules if your institution has access to all three. And you can navigate between them from here as well. Now, on this occasion, I'm actually going to start with the visual resources for this collection. Again, accessed by the navigation bar on the home page. So there are a number of features here, including an interactive trench feature and some films. But I'm interested in the visual galleries today. 
again, there's a variety of different categories that you can choose from. I'm going to have a look at posters. So here are all the posters that we have as part of the First World War collection. They include a lot that were related to recruitment of troops. And there are several from Australia as well. In fact, some of the most striking ones come from Australia. Just wait for this one to load up. This was actually used in Australia's final recruitment campaign and you can see how it emphasizes the threat of German military. Now on the right hand side of the screen you'll notice there's this drop down again. And this gives you metadata information for the image. You can also choose to download the image either as a PDF or you can choose to save it to your own personal archive. Now, if you wanted to compare this to other recruitment posters, you can filter the list to include only material of this type. So if we go back to the list and scroll back up to the top, you'll see that we've got the theme filter here. And we can scroll down, select recruitment, apply. And this is a really good way to compare different types of recruitment, different tactics that were used. And in terms of Australian material, you can see, for example, here, a very similar theme being used in the British recruitment posters and the Australian recruitment poster. Of course, you might be interested specifically in Australian First World War poster content, in which case you could use the advanced search just as we did for migration to new worlds. So if we now go to the documents. Now the filter options for the documents on this resource are at the top of the page rather than the left, but they work in exactly the same way as we saw for Frontier Life. Let's say I'm interested in a particular theatre of war. We know that Gallipoli was very important to Australian and New Zealand troops. So I can filter by that and I can see the different documents that relate to Gallipoli in the resource. Again, the variety is very impressive. There's diaries, there's letters, there's photographs. Posters reports, trench literature as well, magazines produced by the troops. And this is a great item. So this is a film that was shot at Gallipoli. So I'm just going to load this up and let this play for a bit skip some of the introduction. So there isn't actually any footage of the landings at Gallipoli themselves. This was actually taken later once the beach was secured. But it does show troops in camp. You can see them walking around and preparing food. And the intertitles give information about where this was shot and the information that it shows. So I think some of the footage in the First World War resource is really impressive, considering the age of the film, metadata down the right hand side for the films. And you'll notice that I clicked to view that in a high resolution player. So another way to explore the documents is through our popular searches list. 
This is on the top right corner of the screen next to the advanced search. So here you have keywords, not just in English, but in French, German, Italian, and Spanish as well. And these are the most popular searches and the keywords that come up most often within the resource based on our metadata. The same applies with countries, places, names, battles, and theatres of war. You'll see that Australians is one of the keywords that comes up quite a lot. And clicking on it gives us 329 search results for Australians as a keyword. Again, a great variety of document types here. Now, when you click into a particular document that has keywords related to your search, if there's full text results as well, you'll see snippets that show you where the hits have been found on the pages. And clicking into one of those images will take you to a page with a hit on it. So here's Australians undergoing a medical examination. And you can see our search term highlighted in the page itself. If we just expand the metadata, again, the keyword is highlighted in the metadata. The other thing about this document is that it's a photo album that is part of a larger set. So this is album five. And in the documents linked to, you'll be able to click to the next album in the series. And again, here we have a series of photos that relate to the Australian troops. And these photo albums run through the entire war. This one is actually one of the later ones. So if I just use this page jump to go to a specific image, many of these photos are actually from 1919. Uh, and this one is the Dominion Troops Parade through London. So the full span of the war is covered and Australian involvement in it. OK, so the final resource I want to showcase today is Global Commodities. So it's a resource that uses manuscript, printed, and visual primary sources to aid the study of global trade and exchange. And it's centered on 15 of the most significant commodities in world history. If we go up to this introduction section, you can see the 15 listed. Most of the regions of the world are represented in this collection. But as before, you can filter by one that is of interest to you. So if I choose Australasia as my region, click Apply. And here we have a page of results that are related to Australia. Again, can click into a document. This one's about sugar. So this one lists sugar refineries and consumption in Australia and Fiji between 1954 and 1963. Basic data listed here. The great thing about global commodities is that it offers you a global comparative from the same period for anything that you are interested in. So if we go to the advanced search, and we're interested in sugar, we can then apply a date range that is related to the document we've just seen. So look for documents from the 1950s and 1960s.
So you can see that we have 28 documents relating to sugar from this time. You'll notice that some of these documents are produced by the same company from the one that we saw just now, which is in fact this one. So this offers you a worldwide comparison for the material that is directly related to Australia. And to demonstrate that, here is a document that has global significance and looks at sugar mills that are either in existence or are currently being constructed. Now, obviously, a lot of these documents are data heavy. So the other thing that I wanted to showcase from this resource is one of the data tools. So you'll see that there's a few different data tools that are available in here. But the one that I wish to highlight is the price data visualizations. So when you first click in, we'll just expand this. You get an introductory pane that tells you about this tool, how to use it, and the data on which it is based. In the tool itself, it's basically a way of looking at the prices of a huge variety of different commodities over time. And you can focus it on a particular geographical location. So we're currently looking at gold. But if we scroll down here, we were looking at documents related to sugar before. So we can add sugar in remove gold. And then if we click on Australia here, we'll limit our results there. Now the time period you're interested in is determined by this bar at the bottom. So if we zoom out, expand our selection. So what this graph does is give you the price of sugar in Australia from 1850 through to 1920. And it also allows you to compare that price to other factors, such as wages, population, or GDP. So hopefully you can see, looking at the huge range of commodities that are listed here on the left hand side, uh, the different geographical regions you can look at, and these comparative figures, that this is a really powerful data tool for teaching or research. It's only possible to give a very brief overview of it now. But up in this top right hand corner, there's four different scenarios that act as tutorials. There's also information about how the data was collected and how the map was built. And you can also download all of the data as a CSV file. So that's a little taster of some of the primary sources and additional resources relating to Australia that are available in Adam Matthew collections. One other thing that I would highlight on the main website is AM Explorer. So I've been picking and choosing items from various different resources that we offer. But using AM Explorer, you're able to search across all of our collections. And it will allow you to find results in any resource that your institution has access to. So just a very quick example here. Gold rush as a keyword. We know we're interested in Australia. And I'm going to use the date range that I used before when we were looking at migration. So if we search that, it 
it gives you a full list of the Adam Matthew products down the right hand side of the screen. All of those with results will be highlighted. And then here we have our full document list. So you can see that this includes items from Migration to New Worlds, Frontier Life, some of the resources that we've been looking at today. And if you click into one of these documents, you'll get a little panel that gives you the very basic metadata. And you have the option to then click in and view the document in its original resource. So as you can see from that, there's obviously a lot more still to discover on Australia in Adam Matthew resources. And I'd encourage you to start searching the collections to which you have access or to request a trial. You can do that from the website. So here's the main homepage. Click on trials. And you can click here to select any collections that you're interested in trialing. If you have any questions, you can also contact us using the email address or the form on our website, which is up here on the contact page. Thank you very much for your time today.